correct. Anxious fits, people have fits in their argyle withdrawal. Uh, also, it turns on the sympathetic nervous system, so you get this heart pounding and your blood pressure surging. Yes, uh, oh, it's the, know, glut- you- the glutamate stimulates the ner- sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight. It does. It yes, it drives it drives the sympathetic nervous system in the brain, and that then goes into periphery and makes the heart beat and the blood pressure yeah. go up. Essentially. Yeah, and that's what I mean. Some people get even abnormal rhythms of the heart after drinking. Is that a glutamate effect? That's a great question. Now, I suspect it is. One of the, I mean, you've, you're probably aware there's been a lot of interest in the last few years in in cardiac and particularly atrial arrhythmias, yeah. atrial fibrillation. There's a lot of talk about it. A lot of a lot of people are on anticoagulant medication for the fibrillation. A lot of that is due to too much drinking. I think, you know, my recommendation is that anyone who's fibrillating, cut your drinking down. And that's not well known. Most people don't know that. Um, no. Yes, absolutely. And it, same with hypertension. If you've got, if your blood pressure's up, before you go on meds, cut your blood pressure, cut your alcohol down. And, you know, there's quite good data that, you know, giving up drinking will dramatically reduce your, your, your blood pressure by maybe 10 to 15 millimetres systolic. That's a lot. Uh, and as well as that, of course, there's the calorific component because oh, absolutely, you know absolutely. weight is very blood pressure and weight are quite yep. tightly about yeah when it's been estimated, it's been it's we used to think it was old you know men that were drinking and putting on weight through through alcohol but in fact we now know for, it's actually young women a lot of them you know are getting half their calories through alcohol and often they're compensating by eating even less so then they which aggravates you know, their problems. And, you know, alcohol is not a good food source. Why do people eat kebabs on the way home from the pub? Because normally you wouldn't consider eating a kebab. It's unconscionable. Yeah. But after a few pints, it seems like quite a good idea. Yeah, yes. It's, it's a really interesting question, that. <laughs> I've reflected a great deal on that over in my life. <laughs> you, say, you find yourself eating things you don't wouldn't oh, want to eat. Normally. Yeah. I think it's... I don't know the answer to that. It's partly disinhibition, you know, taking away your restraint. Uh, I mean, one of the tips that uh, I think a very powerful tip um, in relation to to weight loss is that people on diet shouldn't drink because alcohol definitely dissolves the resolve not to eat. You know, it's uh, it's very yeah you know, yeah. You've, you've got the calories from the alcohol, and then the calories from then the thing are. Oh, I don't see any reason not to have well, a rice pudding or whatever it is. No, it, alcohol it's alcohol dissolves self control. Yeah. I think we totally. we can all say that. And whether that self control is directed at what you say to people or what you eat. So if you're if you're on a diet, don't drink till you've got to the no. weight you want to get to. So that's partly so it's partly a brain effect, alcohol taking away the, the, the will to restrain but it probably affects appetite as well I mean we know that the, the alcohol changes the metabolism of glycogen in the liver and it probably it puts you into a slightly hypoglycemic state mm. which also then triggers the desire to eat so it's a sort of vicious circle really I've looked after a lot of people with quite severe mental health disorders not as many as you but and a lot of them drink and mm. you know there was always the debate, is this someone with schizophrenia who drinks or is it someone who drinks, you know, w- w- which is cause and effect? Um, I mean, it's a ludicrous question, but I- in mental health, let me put it this, put it this way. In, do people drink who have mental health disorders drink by self-medicating? Yeah, that is actually the much more common route. Right. Strange, it's just very strange. But more people become alcoholic because in in the t- in the late 20s early 30s 40s drinking to deal with stress yeah then are alcoholic from the the ones who are in the teens who are drinking because they for the hell of it yeah but medication is a primary driver and that's so important because if you can work out why they're drinking and then use processes to deal with the anxiety or the depression or the trauma you can really cut down on the drinking I mean, I've certainly drank for both reasons. I've drank for positive reasons because it's fun, mm. especially with your mates. And you know, uh, but I've also drank for negative reasons. Yeah. Um, 
you know, w w when you've been in a job for 20, 25 years and it's not going very well, you've got a lot of, got a lot of uh, stake on the table there, really. It's quite, quite. It, or, or a marriage, a relationship situation. Yeah. It, it's, it's very, very understandable. But I think the thing is, um, the reason we have people like you is to avoid people like me self-medicating. You, you're able to prescribe much more appropriate well, that is than alcohol. Oh, that is true. I mean, you think, but alcohol is a very cunning drug. Mm. I mean, because it, is. it does work when you, you know, if when life is tough, alcohol can dampen down the stress. It can numb you. It can take away a lot of even quite severe trauma. We know military veterans can numb the memories that they can't cope with, with alcohol. But the problem is because of this daily cycle where the alcohol numbs and the brain overcompensates and makes it worse. It's like a ratchet effect. Every time you are suppressing things, they're coming back worse. They're, you know, they're getting energy from the brain adaptations. So in the yeah. end, you end up having the problem that your problems got worse and you're also alcohol dependent, which in itself is a major trauma. I mean, people, once you're dependent on alcohol, you make a lot of bad decisions in life and that then aggravates your, 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 your stress levels. Yeah, but the temptation's always there because, you know, you take that drink and you know that within five or ten minutes, yep. the world's a better place. That instant gratification. It, it is. You, know, it, you know, if you prescribe antidepressants, you know, I'm going to be hanging around for a month waiting to feel better. That is true. Not, not talking true. about psychedelics, but... but um, that is also true. <laughs> but but, but, but with, uh, with alcohol, you know, just bang. Oh, for, oh, oh actually, actually, it's not so bad after all. But of course, the next day, the way I, I think about this is, is with alcohol, you're borrowing happiness from the next day. That's a very interesting analogy. I like that. Yeah. And you, you, pay, you, you pay it back with interest. <laughs> you, you do. Absolutely. Especially that next morning. Can I just make another point? Please. I just, can I, you know, since we're trying to educate people, if you are suffering a lot of anxiety in the morning after drinking the night before, and you're shaky and anxious and worried about going to work, do not ever drink to cope with that. Yeah. We call that relief drinking, and it is the slippery slope. Once you start drinking so that you can function after a night of drinking, yeah. you are essentially you're an alcoholic. Yeah, and again, we, we've seen this really quite commonly. So certainly, I've seen a lot of colleagues drinking at, at lunchtime. So that, that's yes, yes. Uh, so the, this this anxious feeling you get uh, after after uh, it, well but the reason I I had to well I'm not saying I completely stopped drinking but more or less stopped maybe have a blip every few months now but um, was as I've got older um, the drinking a relatively small amount will actually give me quite a bad hangover and and, and this anxiety um, well is it is it some, some is it old age metabolism is it <laughs> Have I just become more sensible, or is there a biochemical you, change that means I can't metabolize it properly anymore? No, you've become more sen It's interesting, you've become more sensible, and, I, and that's uh, what, and what, you, what you've observed is really something that I've observed too. As, as you drink less, you become more vulnerable to what you drink. And, and, and of course, and again, you know, this is the paradox of alcohol. Well, you know, I can, I know if I just have a last glass of wine at night, it will affect my sleep. I absolutely can tell you, you know, a glass of wine and I will wake up half an hour earlier. <laughs> Two glasses of wine, I'll wake up. I, it, absolutely predictable. I'll wake up at three o'clock in the morning being anxious. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before you know you were you you were sort of desensit the system was desensitized now your system is back to normal and and that's so slightly more reactive so that you you experience the com so you don't need so much to get you drunk by the way but if, but on the other hand the, the less even though you drink less you still have the more adaptation in the brain because your brain is is not completely tolerant so if someone's been drinking heavily for a period of time they'll get a physical withdrawal or abstinence syndrome the yes. shakes the dts the delirium tremens um mm. is is that a separate phenomena from a hangover or, or is there an overlap between the two yeah again really interesting question so it's 
there's definitely an overlap in the, in the sense that um, hangovers precede delirium. But delirium is a state where you, uh, your brain becomes so overactive that, uh, well, it starts to make things up, basically. It's a state of uh, hyper hyperglutamate activity, too little GABA activity, too much, strangely, too much dopamine activity. Um, and that's probably because the glutamate system is pushing the dopamine system because it's dopamine is also a stress response system as well as a pleasure system. And then when you get pumping out too much dopamine, you begin to um, get paranoid. And, and delirium is, that's what it is. Delirium is a state where uh, your consciousness is impaired and you become very, very suspicious. You see things, you hear things that aren't there. You, you know, you see classical hallucinations like spiders and elephants and that. And, Snakes, and, yeah. And actually, Snakes, yeah. And delirium tremens is a, is a medical emergency. It, it, people people have seizures and they die in delirium tremens. You've got to treat it really very actively. If people people with severe, you know, people who are very alcohol dependent, they should go through what we would, you know, a medically controlled withdrawal, where they're given drugs like benzodiazepines to dampen down the excitability, so they don't go through. A, a worsening, uh, and which then leads to once they start having seizures or delirium, it's very hard to reverse. Mm. Yeah, we normally give in A and E we give patients uh, Librium, the chlordiazid Correct. oxide, and it it does seem to work remarkably well. Oh, it's been a revolution, actually. Um, yeah, because f you can get basically it's very safe. You know, you give people, especially people who are tolerant to alcohol, they're tolerant to benzos. So you can give them, you know, usually a big dose, 60, 100 milligrams of chlorides of oxide. Mm. And then that sits around in their body for a few days. So it it sort of covers them through the, that period of um, of alcohol withdrawal. I mean, sometimes they need a top up, but usually it's one big dose and then little, top, you know, descending top ups. If you were on a remote island in the Outer Hebrides and your mm. alcoholic friend was going into withdrawal and you couldn't get to a doctor, for the next few days, would it be safer to actually give them a drink so that they could detoxify under medical supervision? Yeah, it probably would. I mean, uh, uh, but you would have to, it would have to be that you gave them the drink rather than that they yeah. took it themselves. Yeah. We used to, John. You might remember. I don't know. You, you might. You're a bit younger than me. But when I first started in medicine, we would occasionally give people intravenous alcohol to do to help them deal with things like withdrawal. It was available as a medicine. I never get. I never gave that. I think I seem to remember it as an antidote for uh, drinking antifreeze. Oh right, it's, uh, it's, yeah. Okay, that, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. yeah. What we used to do was we, 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 when I was a psychiatrist, we gave hemineverin. And of, yes. Of, of course, it was a drink. You poured it out. Yeah. Absolutely. And the alcoholics used to really savour it, and and then and then yeah. the nicker bottle go out and drink hemineverin and alcohol together and get totally plastered. That was, yeah, I mean, there was hope that hemineverin would be uh, essentially um, the methadone for alcohol. Yeah, but it didn't really work. It didn't, it wasn't, it didn't, no, because it, it was, well, it, it didn't have the right, methadone has one great advantage, you just need to take it once a day. Yeah. If you had a, if you had a once a day hemineverin that you, you know, that people, which has taken it would last that long then in a, in a way chlorid epoxide librium is like that yeah yeah i mean and just occasionally we you know we would use it on a regular daily basis to help people stop drinking but the problem is that they can always drink on top yeah. got so much reminiscing from the old psychiatric days <laughs> but i remember we changed it from the drink into the we called it the duck eggs the yellow capsules so you didn't have the uh, that's right, that's you know, right. the tribesmen to say, "I'll give him his duck eggs." You know that, that was that was that was the hem and everin. Um Really serious question. Um, Perry conceptually, hmm. pregnancy. If we do men first of all, um, I mean, if men smoke before they facilitate a conception, that can damage the chromosomes in the sperm and lead to deleterious effects in the in the child that's subsequently born even cancers i mean is that the same with alcohol or can men just carry on merrily drinking while trying to conceive I, i'm not sure it affects the, the genome but it certainly affects um 
the sperm production, I think. And, uh, oh, does it? And it, so I think it, it, it's, it, it impedes fertility in men to some extent. Yeah. And what, what about women drinking round about conception and in pregnancy? It's not ideal, but I want to, I want to qualify this. And, I, and this is important. And yes, yeah, a lot of women become very, very anxious because they discovered they were, they got pregnant because they were, uh, and they were drunk when they got pregnant. Yeah. And then, you know, there are people who would say, well, you know, you've damaged your baby. And the answer is, I think if, if you don't carry on drinking when you're pregnant, you probably haven't damaged your baby. Yeah. But there are a small proportion of women who drink, have, who cannot stop or don't care, and they can drink. Th and then that, that first trimester, heavy drinking the first trimester, is, has a really deleterious effect on the fetus. Yeah. So ideally, once, as soon as you know you're pregnant, you, you stop drinking. And ideally, when you're intending to get pregnant, you don't drink heavily, you know, you, maybe just a glass of wine a day or, or no more, because we don't know exactly what the threshold is. And it's... Mm. It's probable that there's some effect at low levels, but it's the h very high levels that are the real problem. And, and, and people don't realise that fetal alcohol syndrome is, is, is causes more um, developmental problems than than Down syndrome and fragile X put together. So it's it is the most common cause of developmental problems, learning disabilities in kids, and and many of the kids end up being in homes all their lives because the, the behavior is, is so disrupted by the alcohol brain damage. So part of the fetal alcohol syndrome is that the physical architecture of the child's brain is distorted. It is and it's um, which in the same way as that you know their face looks different and, and their hearts may be different but the, the, yeah, they their brain it's it works in a very different and it's it's almost like they're in overdrive. Many of them have really severe hyperactivity. They're, they're sort of relentlessly active. They can't sit still. They're, you know, it, it's like extreme ADHD, and it's probably got something to do with, well, the brains are smaller. And I, I think just so we're now understanding that one of the, the brain is obviously a really complicated organ, but one of the sort of key principles is that the frontal cortex controls the rest of the brain generally yeah and if your frontal cortex is damaged like from a road traffic accident or too much drinking you it's harder to control your behavior and these kids are born without with, with less ability to to regulate their 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 behaviors their activities and and they they, they sometimes just can never learn to to, to to you know to sit in class to read a book you know to, they're just they're just in a you know but they're brain damaged essentially